Hello and welcome to Money, Money, Money. I'm Sumera Abdi. 2016 has started on a tumultuous note for the market. So is this the time to worry and pull out all your money or is this the time to actually keep the faith and plow on? Preparing the ground for the benefits that are to accrue later. After all, as they say, the long-term trend is always up. From 1964, when UTI was the only AMC in India, to the year 2000, when the industry size stood at 79,000 crores, to 2016, when the mutual fund industry has grown to 12.7 lakh crores, which is a compounded growth of about uh, over 16%. So stay invested, that's the mantra. But how do you identify the mutual funds that will suit your asset allocation, first by category, then perhaps by fund house? Feroz Aziz of Anandrati Private Wealth Management joins in with an insight into the peculiarities of every fund that's worth talking about. Feroz, thanks very much for joining in. But, you know, my first question to you is every advisor who comes on the show says stay invested for the long term, right? But has the mutual fund industry actually done justice to the long term investor? Yes, that's a very valid question. When you keep hearing all advisors telling you stay invested for the long term and then you see so many market cycles. Now that's very difficult to lift through the short term. That's when long term can actually arrive, right? Otherwise, if you can't lift through the volatility, yeah. then long term is academic. So now if you actually uh, look at how the industry, when there was privatization in the sector uh, in 93, 94, there were several schemes launched. And in 95, there were about 10, 12 private sector mm. mutual funds. If, if one invested his 100 rupees in Nifty, as against a mutual fund, in the last 20 years, it is 100 rupees has become 900 rupees. That is what is the market's mm. growth. Or at the same time, if you would have chosen all the 10 funds which were available back then and invested 10 rupees in each, the money, 100 rupee, rather than becoming 900 in Nifty, in the industry, all good, bad, ugly schemes, 100 has become 2,700. Mm. So, so an alpha or an extra return vis-a-vis -vis the Nifty, of close to about 1,500 rupees on a base of 100. Mm. That's a reasonable value add as an industry which has been provided in the long run, long run here taken as 20 years. Okay, but what about the two extremes then? I mean, uh, you, I know in the long term there is no unlucky investor. But what about like the luckiest investor or the unluckiest investor? What would be uh, uh, the returns that they could have made over this period? A very, very interesting question. See, what happens is this is like mechanically mm. taking 95 and then do, comparing it with 2015. Mm. Where it was not, there were so many trading days where people could have invested. Mm. Now, if you actually took four first private sector funds and if you checked if 10 years was the invested, it's my investment time frame, every day if one invested for 10 years, different people, mm. the luckiest guy, for example, in the fund, Franklin Blue Chip Fund, made 33% compounded as against the most unluckiest 10-year investor hmm. made 14% return compounded. So even if you were the unluckiest 10-year investor in a Franklin Blue Chip Fund, for example, you've made 14% compounded growth, right, which is twice hmm. more than debt currently. All you need to wish and pray is 10 years. The investing time frame is hmm. dependent on you. You just have to wish and pray that you're not the unluckiest uh, more unlucky than the unluckiest, and then 14% compound and growth. Yeah, and even the unluckiest isn't too bad, actually. Absolutely. <laughs> so it's not even so much as fund selection as the fact that you've got to remain invested once you're in. Right. Okay, but, uh, you know, these kind of returns, mm. therefore, should ideally be able to be replicated over the next 10, 20 years as well, right? So what are the top categories then? I mean, should categories even matter over the next 10, 20 years, or is it just enough to say that, okay, invest today and then just stay invested? core portfolio should comprise of only three categories mm -hmm. and I emphasize only three categories large cap funds mid cap funds and opportunistic funds mm -hmm. opportunity funds as they call them if you look at the average returns of these three categories over 10 year three year five year time frames you would see that in the large cap category the average of all the large cap funds mm -hmm. which are hundred odd funds put together for the last 10 years is 14 percent but the top 25% of these 100 schemes have generated more than 14, of course, because they're the top 25% mm. schemes, and that is about 18 and half. So there's a difference of 4%. So first point which I'm trying to make is don't get digressed with all these interesting options. So like Warren Buffett said, if you're, if you're enjoying investing, mm. most likely you're not making money. In the mid-cap category, 
average is 26 for 10 years, but the top quartile is 33. Mm -hmm. And in the opportunities, um, opportunity funds, which can invest in any size of companies, the average is about 18, and the top 25% uh, of the schemes is about close to 23, 24. Wow. So the averages and the top have a difference of 4 to 5 percent in each category. You know, that's true actually because even if you were to ask any celebrity today about their work and you think that it's all glamour and they'll tell you that actually it's just all hard work. So that's what it is, stock picking or even mutual funds is just down to hard, boring work and that's Absolutely. really all it takes. But tell me something, Firoz, over the years, you know, you've been coming on this show, you've recommended some really good performing funds, right? Now, if I want a large chunk of of my portfolio to be in that top quartile or the top 25 percent how do I actually ensure that very importantly there are two methods of selecting for example how do we do it hmm. okay one one method which is just to attach yourself to a good research guy who can actually choose the schemes for you hmm. all right if you can afford a uh, financial planner it'll help now how does Anand Rati choose the schemes for example there are two methods one which is a objective method which is more hmm. statistical in nature okay. is to find seven parameters which actually have a very strong correlation to future performance see one is choosing on the basis of past performance. Mm. Statistically, there are subjects available in statistics which help you understand future projections. Like a company projects its future. Mm. Right? Projects, of course, there could be a dispersion from the projections. But there are seven, eight statistical variables which have a strong degree of impact on future performance. So Anand Rath, he uses a combination of these mm. seven. The other thing, which is the more subjective thing, is a fund manager's job is to take decisions. So I call them right to wrong ratios. Mm -hmm. Okay, If his job is to take decisions, if you just understood his last hundred decisions and found out how many were right, how many were wrong, mm -hmm. it gives you a very good sense whether the fund manager is taking more right decisions or wrong. So any fund manager who takes 80 right decisions out of the hundred, then you latch on to that fund manager and say that mm -hmm. I'm going to stay with him. Or then you can rely on money control, for example, mm -hmm. who does a lot of such work and gives mm -hmm. you the output yeah. in the form of star ratings so make sure that you choose the schemes right that's when you will be in the top 25 percent of the schemes and like you rightly pointed out it's very important over the years that your schemes largely fall in the top 25 percent mm. which is called the top quartile in the nomenclature which okay. we see so you've listed out now two ways one is to go the direct route one is to go through a broker right Correct. but if i were to go direct i would see a better return, right, or perhaps lower charges, whatever. Uh, what is the case for an investor to actually go with a broker? Why should I take a broker? The first is the understanding the cost implication of these two options which the investor has. The cost differential is between 0.5 to 0.7 percent per annum. See, in the equity category, what happens is the best and the worst funds have a very large dispersion. Okay, mm. so if you go wrong, in a scheme, you might lose 5-10%. But the cost of choosing a broker is as little as 05 to 0.7%. So people generally, large investors for example, choose on the debt side direct. On the equity side, okay. they choose a broker. Because on the debt side, if you went wrong, the implication of going wrong is just a 1.5-2%. Mm. So you would want to save cost there. But if going wrong on equity can wash away the cost of the next 20 years in one year. So you're better off paying the cost and saying that he will be able to recover the cost. So, so this is a dif disparate, uh, different strategy on two sides of the assets. Debt, mm -hmm. you can go still direct, but equity, never choose to actually be penny wise and pound foolish mm -hmm. and say I'll save 0.5. But if you go wrong one year, you've lost 10%, which is next 20 years cost is gone in a year. Mm -hmm. And if you get one bad year in 20 years, you've washed away all the benefit of the cost advantage. Yeah, that's true. Actually, that's some interesting math over there. And I hate to cut short this conversation, but we've got to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to continue talking with Feroz and we're going to tell you all about the fine print of the mutual funds, including the various charges. When does it make sense to pay the exit load and a whole lot more? Stay tuned. We'll be back in just a bit.
Welcome back to Money, Money, Money. In these times of severe ups and downs, how does one actually ride the wave of volatility? Which mutual funds should you be looking at investing in and why? That's the question we're asking Firoz Aziz of Anand Rati Private Wealth Management. So Firoz, you've given us a bit of a lowdown on how to go about finding the good funds. But how many funds are ideally required in a portfolio? I mean, when does it become too much to have too many funds in my opinion not more than eight to nine schemes at the maximum however big your portfolio is should be in the equity category actually in the debt category you don't need so much diversification you need only four to five schemes in the debt category at maximum if he doesn't do that it's statistically observed that if you are beyond this it actually mm -hmm. reduces your return uh, rather than just adding value in terms of increased return. Mm -hmm. At least in the equity category, you should not overlap schemes, identify mm -hmm. the strengths of the asset management company and just go with their strength. Mm -hmm. Go with their flagship schemes. Don't go with their satellite schemes, which are the peripheral focuses. That's, that's the input I would want to. Okay. The other thing think. is in the equity market, there's a lure of the primary market. Like everyone wants to latch onto the next big IPO. So similarly, a lot of people over here prefer investing in NFOs as opposed to the already existing schemes. Which is the better route? That's uh, the marketing aspect of mutual fund companies mm. who would keep telling you, why don't you go with the new fund offer? It is mm. starting at 10 rupees. Yeah. So people have a notion that I'm buying it cheap. Mm. See, anywhere price, price doesn't matter anywhere where there's unlimited supply. Mm. For example, the difference between a stock and a mutual fund, very important for people to understand this is, in a stock, if you want to buy 100 shares, you will have to find a seller for 100 shares. Mm. But in a mutual fund, on the contrary, if somebody says, I want to invest 1,000 crores today, for example, mm. just magnifying the example to make my point, he doesn't need a seller mm. of the units. The asset management company can create units and give you. Mm. So if you buy a scheme of 500 rupee NAV or a 10 rupee NAV, you mm. have to be agnostic and indifferent to the NAV, actually. In fact, you have to prefer the NAV of 500 because there has been a large track record of established processes mm. to actually turn the 10 rupee NAV to 500. Therefore, how often should one churn their portfolio? If I take my example, I had a client and I was advising him to move around and I saw that he was not making return. And then I realized what is going wrong. And then when I checked in the same fund uh, and the same scheme, I checked another fund, uh, another investor who had put just about 40,000 rupees and forgotten about it. The one where I was doing this active management, I had generated one third the return than the one which was static. So that day I realized my advice was actually acting detriment in 2009. Then I promised to myself that I'm not going to overmanage the portfolio by moving around. And then I acknowledged to the client that, see, I, I being the picture and you being the picture has brought down the return. So let's stay static. Now coming back to your specific question of when do you actually make a change? It doesn't mean that no change. Hmm. Change when there is a structural change in the scheme. If he changes the objective, change the scheme, to exit out of the scheme. If there is a change of the fund manager, definitely you should consider a change. If there is three, four, five, six months of underperformance, mm. that is actually used 90% of the times as a preface for a change. Mm. So that's actually not a structural change. It mm. is lower performance should not be always the case of change. But if you're making change, if there is a structural change, even if you have to pay an exit load, for example, of 1%, mm. you're still better off doing that than mm. staying on to a scheme where there's a fund manager change and stuff. Okay, uh, so in that case, uh, when is it okay to even pay also higher fund management charges? I mean, does that depend on the fund manager and who would be your top choices for fund managers? A uh, little known fact is that uh, larger schemes have a lower fund management charge. This fund management charge in a small mm. scheme can be as high as 25 and in a large scheme can go as low as 1.75, depending on the assets they mm. manage. But the good part is, unlike any other industry, the good guys come cheap, mm. right? Because the largest fund manager who manages 10,000 crore fund comes to you at 1.75. But I think charge vis-a-vis -vis the return is a very small portion. In mm. equity, if I enter, I'm looking at 15, 17% return. Mm. So charge is 2%, 1.5%. 
three percent, some somewhere there between one one point seven five and two and a half percent. But in a debt scheme, you need to be more charge sensitive mm. because you're earning nine percent, and if you're mm. paying two percent, as a ratio of what you earn to what you pay, is significantly mm. larger in a debt scheme. Okay, that makes a lot of sense actually and it's a very valid point you raised about debt funds. So what we'll do is take a very quick break. When we come back, we'll tell you everything you ever wanted to know about debt funds and investing in them. Stay tuned. We'll be back in just a bit. Welcome back to Money, Money, Money. So we've gotten the lowdown on equity mutual funds, but what about the debt variety? What's the scope there? Firoz Aziz of Anandrati Private Wealth Management is our guide this week, and he's been answering all of these questions and a lot more. So Firoz, finally on to debt then. Uh, you've already raised quite a few valid points about the fund management charges, etc. Uh, but within debt, uh, should one actually look at now the balance fund, I know that it has the tax treatment of an equity fund, but a lot of people look at it to satisfy their debt criteria. Is that okay? I mean, should it be a part of your debt portfolio? It can't be a part of your debt portfolio. See, as if for, but it's very good for somebody who's doing a systematic investment plan. If he doesn't have large lump sum investments, if he's doing systematic investment plan, a balanced fund is a very, very good method mm -hmm. because he's recurringly investing. Mm -hmm. If he did the same thing with an debt fund because there is three years for it to become long term as against one year mm. then every installment needs to finish three years yeah which is very difficult right so you use a balanced mm. fund now here every installment needs to finish one year, one year. which is yeah. a relaxed norm but if you're doing a lump sum investment you can mm. definitely envisage that you will stay invested for three years mm. but if you're doing a systematic investment plan and then you have a few of fewer of your installments which are finished long term mm. and a fewer of them which went six months back and you can't touch the folio at all you can't yeah. redeem the money so if you're doing SIPs a balanced fund is a very very good option but if you're doing lump sum you're better off splitting the money in the best large cap and the best debt fund and stay invested for three years that's okay. right and has the time also now come to choose between uh, duration funds and accrual funds I mean should one now forget about capital appreciation and just start looking at the interest in coup? see I personally think that people generally have a tendency to move from one end of the spectrum to the other. Mm. So this spectrum actually has some funds called the short-term funds and funds which don't aspire mm. to have capital gain. They only try and get interest income. The other end is a guilt fund mm. which, which whose large portion of the return is going to be capital appreciation. Yeah. Don't move from this spectrum to this. So there are two other steps in the middle. Just go mm. from this step to this and the second step is a dynamic bond mm. fund. Hmm. which says that in three years, which is going to be my investment time frame, there will be periods where taking interest rate risk or taking duration might not make sense. Let me delegate that decision to the fund manager hmm. so that in three years he might change the opinion two, three times and I don't have hmm. to do that. So move from accrual funds, which generally focus on only the interest income, hmm. Hmm. not the interest risk, a dynamic bond fund delegates the interest risk management mm. to the fund manager and then moving to income funds and guild funds. So no no to these mm. income funds and guild funds. Dynamic bond funds definitely could form a part of the portfolio today. Okay, then let me give you another set of choices, which is between a taxable bond fund and a tax-free uh, bond, right? Because the return, okay, the difference in the return would be about 100 basis points higher for a taxable fund. So even if I stay invested for three years, would it not make sense? Because even in a tax-free bond, I would stay invested for three years or more. So wouldn't a taxable bond fund then make sense for me? Taxable bond fund would make sense. Hmm. See, actually, this quarter, You've, you've reminded me of one very, very important point. Trying to build your portfolio in the first quarter of the calendar year, which is Jan to March category, you will be able to get four indexations if you actually invested today and exited in April 2019. So a debt fund becomes zero tax hmm. if you actually got four indexations hmm. for three quarter years. So in this quarter, this question is so valid that you should take up a tax 
uh, taxable debt fund because mm -hmm. by the virtue of having indexation, you it will become tax free anyway. Yeah. So you are better off getting that one one quarter percent more than a tax free bond and not losing out the one point two five percent, which is a large component mm -hmm. in a debt category. Because yeah. that, uh, so I would say you should use a taxable debt fund rather than a tax free bond if not anything, at least in this quarter, and exit in April 19, which will give you four indexations and you will be on a tax-free tangent. What anyway. about the rest of the year? <laughs> rest of the year, you need to again introspect on the differential return between the tax freeze availability and the right. debt fund. Okay. Right? Now the differential is large enough, 1.25%, I would not let go of on the debt category because mm -hmm. it's a very large jump. Yeah. I would rather take a taxable debt fund. Then if the differential is narrow, then you're better off in a tax tax free bond. But mm. if the difference remains as one one quarter, you should certainly go with a tax free bond. A tax uh, tax taxable, taxable bond. Fund. <laughs> All right, Piroz, on that note, thanks very Thank much so for joining much. in. I hope you have a fantastic year. You do and too. thanks very much once Thank again. Thank you so much. All right, on that note, it's uh, time for us to wrap up. It's about all we have this week. Viewers, remember, keep writing to us at money, money, money at network18online.com. You can also find us on Twitter, write to CNBC TV 18 News. Use the hashtag money. And remember that you can also log on to YouTube to catch this as well as all our previous episodes. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again next week.